Good evening, everybody. Uh, before we begin, I just want to say that the books of these authors will be available uh, at Greenlight Bookstore outside the building, uh, where they will also be signing immediately following this program. Uh, so I'm Julian Lucas, your moderator. Thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you had a great festival and you couldn't have picked a better finish than our panel, Rewriting Africa, from pre-colonial kingdoms to today. Uh, I have the honor of introducing three incredibly talented authors. Uh, Leonora Miano, born in Cameroon. Oh, okay, my mic. Is this good? Okay. <laughs> so our first panelist is Leonora Miano. Born in Cameroon, Leonora moved to France in 1991. She is the author of 14 books that have been translated into many languages. Her award-winning debut novel, Dark Heart of the Night, was released in 2005. Her other books include Contour du Jour qui vient, which was awarded the Prix Goncourt des Lyciens. And today we'll be discussing Season of the Shadow, published in English by Seagull Books earlier this year. The novel is about an isolated Cameroonian village at the beginning of the slave trade era, where 10 mothers of mysteriously disappeared sons have been quarantined to keep their misfortune from spreading. One mother's attempt to investigate leads her to the edge of the known world. Upon its release in 2013, Season of the Shadow won the prestigious Prix Femina and the Grand Prix du Roman Métis. Welcome, Leonora. Our next panelist is Wayatu Moore, the founder of One More Book, a nonprofit publisher and bookseller that encourages reading among children of countries with low literacy rates and underrepresented cultures. She's been featured in The Economist magazine, NPR, NBC, BET, and ABC, among others, for her work in advocacy for diversity in children's literature. And her short fiction has appeared in Freeze and the Paris Review. Wayatu debuted as a novelist earlier this week. Congratulations. Thank you. With She Would Be King, published by Grey Wolf. She is Liberian by way of Texas and Brooklyn, and her novel recounts that country's founding through the lives of three protagonists cursed or gifted with special powers. Our final panelist is Jennifer Nansubuga Makumbi, a Ugandan novelist and short story writer. She is the recipient of this year's Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize, awarded just a few days ago. Congratulations. And won the overall Commonwealth Short Story Prize in 2014 for Let Us Tell the Story Properly. She has a collection of short stories, Love Made in Manchester, coming out with Transit and One World in spring 2019 and a second novel, The Women, is due out from One World in 2020. Today we'll be discussing her debut novel, Chintu, which won the Kwani Manuscript Project in Kenya in 2013 and was published in 2014 by Kwani Trust. The novel is an epic retelling of Uganda's history that follows a family curse from the pre-colonial era into the 20th and 21st centuries came out in the United States with Transit Books last year, and another edition is now out from One World. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, so I wanted to start our discussion today with a theme that is in all three of your books, and, and that is the curse. Uh, your novels all center characters who are cast out in some way, who are marked by misfortune, uh, and these ultimately propel your narratives. So I was wondering what curses as a narrative device allowed you to achieve creatively? Uh, why was it a good fit for the kind of story that you wanted to tell? Uh, we could begin with whoever wants to answer first. Uh, so who would like to answer first? <laughs> I think you're better off pointing out <laughs> names because we are going to keep on tossing it around. I can't. Okay. 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 Why are you? Okay. Okay. The youngest. Um, yes, the youngest, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I've been a fan of the fantasy genre for a very long time, all my life. 
And I think what I, what I, know, what I knew to be true of the superheroes that I read about or that I witnessed on screen is that they tended to be from vulnerable backgrounds. And my work features superheroes or people who are gifted, who are not only from vulnerable backgrounds, but who are also from systemically oppressed groups. And I really wanted to explore what happens when someone who is systemically or institutionally vulnerable realizes his or her power. Um, and that's, that was my consideration, my main consideration while writing these characters. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, usually, I do not, uh, I do not um, speak English. I write in French, and I think in French. Uh, just got here yesterday, <laughs> so I'm about to make uh, a few mistakes. A few mistakes. I'm speaking, I'm speaking to you uh, this afternoon. Uh, I did not think of uh, the curse per se as a theme. I wanted to write a novel that uh, I missed as a reader. So I wanted to write a novel dealing with um, uh, a part of the, uh, the story of the uh, transatlantic uh, trade that is not very often uh, told. Um, so I wanted to write about the uh, sub-Saharan uh, experience in a very intimate, uh, in its very uh, intimate uh, aspects. So uh, my uh, goal was to uh, uh, depict uh, the uh, the experience of uh, families whose loved ones had been snatched, because when we speak of the trade, we never say that uh, uh, the people who were taken away uh, were someone's family. Somebody knew their names. Somebody uh, uh, wanted to know what happened and sometimes didn't know. So uh, it's not really the curse, it's, uh, you know, some kind of uh, unknown, unspeakable tragedy that happens in your life, in your daily life. And not only the life of uh, a person, but the life of a community who's, um, you know, young males will be taken away with no um, how to put it, um, no way for the community to understand what happened, all right? Does anybody speak French in the audience? <laughs> you know? <laughs> no? You should, you should learn some French. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, you know. I, I live in France and I've been living there for long and um, the French read a lot of American literature. Some, a lot of American writers come to France and they never have to speak French. <laughs> Even when they know the language, they, they don't have to because we're happy to hear them in their language. <laughs> so you should try that. Okay, stop, stop here for now. Um. In my case, the, the, the idea of a curse has been thrown about in my life all the time. It doesn't matter whether it was biblical, there was a curse, whether it was families in the village, many were cursed. You know, curses are something that I grew up with. And when I started writing the novel, perhaps it just happened. I didn't think about it. That, you know, this is a major theme I'm going to use. But it's because everything, mental health, your caste, somebody dies, 
your cars, you know. So it, we, we, it's a very lazy way of thinking sometimes, but we do it where I come from. So I guess it was something that I easily looked at. So in Uganda, at, at a national level, the, you know, Uganda is cursed. Uh, we are cursed because we sold our own. We are cursed because we got rid of the Asians in the 70s. I mean, everything that goes wrong in Uganda, it's definitely a curse. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but also, um, my father um, had mental health problems when I was growing up. Um, to put it briefly, he, in 1975, he was arrested by Idi Amin's men, and he was brutalized. And after we were lucky to get him back, because most of my friends didn't get their fathers back. But afterwards, uh, we lost him in terms of mind. And until he died in 2011, we ne he never recovered his mind. But um, so for a long time, we thought that that was the reason for his mental health. But sometimes our families get together, you know, if we have the fourth great-grandfather together, we could, we could all get the families together and get to know each other. Someone whispered in my ear that, you know, mental health runs in the family, you know? And of course, the anxiety that comes from knowing that, I try to deal with it in the book. Um, you know, that the mental health is a curse and I could get it. So that's where it comes from, in my case. So I want to ask each of you how you decided to tell the stories that you do in the way that you do. Because uh, Leonora, when you mentioned that the, the stories of those who were left behind by the Atlantic trade to, of, of the societies that were destroyed, uh, as happens in Season of the Shadow, that story is not one that we often think of when we think of the story of the Atlantic slave trade. The same goes, uh, Wyatu, with your novel. We, you know, we think of it as something with a trajectory from Africa to the Americas, and, and we don't pay a lot of attention to Liberia, to Sierra Leone, to, to the people who uh, returned to certain settlements and, and colonies. And, and I'm wondering uh, how you, in choosing the, the kinds of stories you were going to tell, how did you shape them? So I, I've just, so Leonora, your, your novel is very circumscribed in a, in a certain way. It's, it's one village and the, the village is in contact with its neighbors, uh, but the kind of shadow of the slave trade that falls is at a remove. And, and there's, a, there's a sense in which looking out from that keyhole, uh, the, the immensity is almost heightened by, by the fact that we're, we're starting from such a small village. So thinking of that, how did you think of shaping that particular story? Well, I, um, first, uh, you said um, earlier that uh, the story was set in, uh, in Cameroon. It's not the case. Uh, Cameroon did not exist. <laughs> and uh, also, the, the the novel is written from the point of view of its its main characters. So there's no Cameroon, there's no Africa, there's no blackness, there's right. no Europe. Which is part of what what's so interesting yeah. about it is 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 that because you... in in their thinking, in their world view, there's no Africa, and these people are not Africans living in Africa. And it's very interesting for us to know that we define ourselves as Africans, but our ancestors were not Africans. Um, so how did, how did I decide to, uh, to, to, to shape, to, to, to build the story? I wanted to work on uh, a tiny community, a small place, uh, like um, we have, um, we have many, uh, we still do have many of those small places in Central Africa um, where, uh, you know, people live their daily lives and all of a sudden they're hit by, by what will become history. 
But for them, it is just a fire that starts, you know, at night. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to work on a very small, small community that will uh, experience uh, something that actually will be uh, so big, so big. But for them, it is just and, uh, you know, um, how, how, to, how to say it uh, uh, in a smart way in English? Now I'm wondering. Um, of course, I would be smart in French, but um, <laughs> and, and uh, smart and faster, of course, but um, yeah. So, but, but I think you, you all got me because you're smart. Yeah, yeah, so you know what I, I was trying to do because my aim was really to, to work on the uh, uh, intimate part of the story. So I had to do it with very simple people living simple lives. And all of a sudden, the world that you know, the world that you've always known, uh, is is broken and it 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 will be broken forever forever it even uh, threatened to uh, disappear you know so but you just have to read the novel I think it's good I worked hard <laughs> and uh, and the translator is good too so you you really have to read it by the way I just came to tell you that you just have to read it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that is one purpose. Of and uh, I have to apologize to my two colleagues here. I wanted to read your novels, your books, and I asked for them, but they never reached me in France, so I never got them. Maybe when I return, yeah. but I'll be happy to read, of course. Another thing that, that all three of you do in your books is you're telling these broad historical stories uh, that really decenter Europe. So, Leonora, in your novel, the subject is, of course, the Atlantic slave trade, but there are no European characters, and they sort of appear at the rim of this world as the men with hen feet, with the, the coastlanders. And uh, Wayatu, similar to your work, you're writing about a colonial experience with the founding of, of Liberia, uh, but it's, it's different because it's an, it's an African-American settler colony. And, uh, and of course, Jennifer, your novel, you, you move from pre-colonial Uganda into the 20th century. So, so what kind of stories does that make possible, uh, r r moving away from this kind of African-Europe encounter model of, of African literature? OK. Um, can I go? Yes. Um, First of all, um, I know um, that's, that's a wonderful thing to say that Africans who were taken in the beginning didn't look at themselves as Africans. Um, they were Mulongo. I started reading your book. It is fantastic. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I, I wrote um, Chintu and uh, I set it in 1750 up to 1760. And then I jumped uh, the colonial period and came into Uganda post-independence. And the reason for that for me was because I traveled to Britain to study literature and creative writing. And I was told that anything that I study, as long as it's African literature, it's to be studied within the confines of post-colonial studies. And uh, for me, it felt like I'm trapped in Europe, like Europe defines Africa as if Africa did not exist before Europe arrived. And um, I realized that Africa, any studies about Africa are either framed in pre-colonial, God, so annoying, um, colonial or post-colonial. Either way, Africa could not exist outside Europe. And I, so I wrote out of anger. And, and I brutally cut Britain out of my novel. 
Um, but also, I noticed when I was um, in Britain, again, doing literature, African literature, that, uh, for example, in Uganda, we grow up on things fall apart. I mean, you read it, and you read it, and you read it, and you read it, you know? <laughs> and when we were studying, and I taught it, as if reading it wasn't enough, but, but when we were studying things fall apart, we were not so much concerned about Europe. No. We, we were concerned about Okonkwo. Okonkwo the man. Okonkwo the father, the husband, the son. Okay? And we looked at the fear of fear. You know, the power of anxiety. And how anxiety can take you to the heavens. Because he was so frightened of being weak and fa being a failure. So that lifted him to the heavens but is this something that brought him down and he ended up dying like a dog okay and we were so concerned about that but when i arrived here in britain uh, it was all about oh look how britain went to africa and destroyed the society okay yes it happened they destroyed that society but for goodness sakes look at Africans as well. This book is about Africa, it's not about Europe. But I, I noticed that put Europe in your book and Europe will look at itself. And your, your, your society will be peripherized. So I thought, okay, yes, yes, it was horrible. Colonization was horrible, but the British were enjoying themselves a little too much when we wrote about them. I cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I uh, did not have to brutally cut out <laughs> anything. It was just not the issue. I, I wanted to work on, uh, you know, um, a small community of people that, that can not be called African, but you know, I was interested in uh, the way people lived, their culture, their spirituality, their, their world view, and uh, what would be uh, shat uh, shattered and uh, destroyed by the trade later. I wanted to uh, I wanted people to uh, encounter another way of life that had existed in those places. So Europe was just not the issue, uh, you know. So um, it's not there. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. I was going to say what it does for me is it allows you to explore characters in perhaps an intraracial context. It allows you to explore their humanity when they aren't under the thumb of colonialism or slavery because I think as a writer and sometimes as a reader when we think about historical fiction or any fiction de dealing with imperialism and slavery and those sort of topics, we tend to think in the binary, white versus black and you know, um, in the Liberian context, Americo-Liberian versus indigenous and we aren't paying attention to some of the subtleties that exist within those relationships and within those groups. I think that the tendency to go about reading um, and expecting identity, identity is spectacle, culture is spectacle in the American literary canon. I think that's very much part of the infrastructure of American literature, is othering anything that is considered minority or culturally significant, and I don't think that that is going to change at any point. So. Um, to Jennifer's point, of course, if you include the Western character, then the West is going to pay attention to it. So that's why it's a wonderful reminder to pay attention to some of the publishing houses that are growing and continue to grow on the continent, that are able to write freely and write without the context of slavery or colonialism. They are writing about very 
wonderful day-to-day -day human concepts um, that can translate across cultures. Um, you mentioned Kwani before. Cassava Republic is another great publisher that's on the continent. Um, Baobab Press, they publish children's books and they're growing and I think that African writers and African publishers are also exploring self-publishing as a way to get our works out there because then it seems like you are not writing to be accepted by a Western audience, but you're writing your humanity as, a, as opposed to your identity or your culture as spectacle. That's a, that's a very good point. And, and I did want to point out that, uh, you know, we, we have here three people who've been published in a very wide context. And I think here in Brooklyn, at the, the Brooklyn Book Festival, we, we think of, a lot of people think of this as, oh, this is the epicenter of the literary world, which is, of course, not true. Uh, and I wonder if I could ask you, you know, Leonora, you're published with a press that's headquartered in, uh, in India, in English, and you've been translated into many different languages. Jennifer, you were first published in, in Kenya, and you've been published in, in the UK, and, and here with an indie house. What have you noticed is, is different in the, the reception that your books receive uh, at, at home, in, in your own countries, in other African countries, and, and then also between Europe and the United States. And, and where do you see, uh, what institutions, why do you have started us out with a few, um, but where do you see the, the future institutions and reading communities for African literature? Can I just piggyback off of what I was just saying? So I was, I think expectation bias is just a part of publishing. Once your art marries commerce, it morphs into something else. And so for African writers in the United States, a lot of the publishers are looking at comps, and comps are what is just like this book that is sold before and that is sold well, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why you have the popularization of the contemporary African immigration story. When my publisher initially went out with my story, which is like African fantasy, magical realism, pre-Black Panther, right? Um, <laughs> We got a lot of no's, like, you know, what do you, what do you mean? I mean, what do we have to compare this to? Maybe Ben Okri, but he's older, she's younger, she's, you know, from an immigrant background. Why not write the immigrant story? Because they have comps for that. And this translates, this is most immigrant groups, not specifically African. There is a formula, and the formula is, you know, you're, you're in your home country. Said home country experiences some political conflict move to Western country, you have issues of assimilation, and then at some point, at the tail end of that assimilation process, you go back to home country, and you realize I'm neither, but I'm both. And, and, and this, is, this is the formula throughout. And that's not to say that there aren't subtleties within those stories, and those stories can't be made unique and individualized, but it's almost like a rule. And because there are examples of this selling, and this selling well, me, as a young Liberian writer, Liberian-American writer, if I go to a publisher, to an agent, they'll be like, oh, so when did you come here? Like, what is your story? But what is your story is, what is your story that fits this comp, that's, that fits this formula that we know will sell? So expectation bias then being such a, 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 being so prevalent, I think, in American literature, it really does restrict the direction that African writers and African literature can go. Um, in my case, um, Jintu was rejected by everybody who could reject it <laughs> in the West. Um, and actually, even when it won the Kwani Manuscript Prize, and at this, uh, a year later I won the Commonwealth Short Story Prize, and I told everybody, oh now, they, they, I'm just gonna throw them out. Like, who, who will I take? No, they rejected the novel mm -hmm. quite outright. And it Luckily, it was well received in Africa, and it was reviewed by a lot of African author, rather uh, reviewers, and they were saying, "This is how we like African stories." But uh, the major thing was that it, what my novel was too African. I might as well warn you. Um, uh, it was too African because uh, I, the Europe, Europe was missing, but oh. But also, I, again, as a result of studying in Europe, I, I went specifically for an African audience. 
Um, normally, people don't focus on, focus on audience. But I had been studying um, a theory on reception and readership. And I became aware that w the way you write depends on whom you're thinking of. So in the beginning, I was writing for the world, which means really you're writing for the British and American audiences. Mm -hmm. but, but then my characters were not right for some reason. And then I switched, and I imagined that I was talking to a Ugandan. You know, I remove everybody else, and in, here in front of me was a Ugandan. And I noticed that my language changed. My attitude changed. The things I was talking about changed totally. So uh, I was doing things that I would not do if I was considering a Western audience. When language was, you know, the English language can sometimes throw tantrums on the page when you're writing, I would just put English away and go into Luganda and just help because other Ugandans don't speak my language. But I would make it in such a way that you understood the context. And that is what made it very African, you know? So um, I realized when I was growing up in Uganda, I read Shakespeare, I read Tom Sawyer. I did the, uh, the British canon and a bit of American canon. And they didn't care whether a kid, or a woman or man at the equator in Africa understands them. So while I was writing, I kept on thinking, why should I fall over or bend backwards for the West to understand me? You know, their writers do not. Ian McEwan writes like everybody is British. <laughs> you know, why should I try so hard to, you know, so I focused mainly on Ugandan readers. And it was very, very gratifying hearing people saying, I can't believe you wrote about my village. I, I think you knew my family, because we live here and we live there, and our names. It, it was so exciting because I didn't have these stories when I was growing up. The closest I had was a conquo. So in a way, that is, locked me out of the public shirts in Europe. But I thought, they will get around to it. I'm not going to change it. And it seems like more and more they are, so. Uh, so I want to ask a few more specific questions about your books. Uh, so, Leonora, um, I suppose most historical fiction is about collective origins, about we and, and whoever we are and how we got from here to there. Uh, but your book, as you were saying before, is about a people who are destroyed, people who do not have a postscript. And, and I wonder what you think we learn from thinking about those stories and from telling those stories? What's, what's important about telling the stories of those who, who did not continue in the historical narrative? Well, I, I, um, I, I will not answer in general. I will answer specifically about the uh, transatlantic experience for me as uh, someone who was uh, born and raised in Africa, I really miss the, uh, the African narrative. I think uh, we have a lot to say about that specific event. Uh, and uh, for many reasons, we have been um, uh, prevented, our voice has been you know, um, comment dire uh, entravé, Nathalie? <laughs> you know, uh, our voice has been prevented from, you know, expressing itself. And we have va various stories to tell about that particular event and also um, a lot of the, uh, the victims stayed, remained on the continent. And uh, so I have no general answer but, uh, as regards this specific story. Uh, there's a lot Africa has to tell. And uh, I need to, to start somewhere. 
I, I needed to start somewhere uh, in order maybe to, uh, you know, make other people consider the, uh, the importance of our, our narratives, of our, our um, uh, the way we view things, uh, the way we see it. If I could ask you a more specific question about the book. Um, so I think one, one of the fascinating things that I learned uh, was reading about the stilt village of Bebe Yedi in, in your narrative. And uh, this is sort of, in the novel, a, a group of those who have escaped from the slavers built a stilt village in a, a marshy river area uh, where and they kind of create a new culture even though some of their clans have been destroyed. So it's, it strikes me that when we think about the slave trade, we think about the new societies that were created in the Americas, but there were even new societies that were formed uh, in Africa yes, by these events. And, uh, I got the inspiration for, for, for Bebayedi uh, in Benin because those places really exist and you can still visit them today. B by Cotonou, there's a village like that, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, Ganvier, it's the, 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 the most famous one. It is called Ganvier in Benin. So, uh, but the story of those places are never told. You don't know them. So this is the uh, intimate African experience of the, uh, what you call the slave trade, which is not the proper way to call it. Because when you say the slave trade, it's like, it's as if uh, Africa was uh, inhabited by two categories of people, slavers and slaves. Uh, you know? Uh, when you say the slave trade, you imply that the people who were taken away were slaves originally. Originally, the majority of them were free. Which yeah. is why perhaps yeah. the Atlantic experience the And experience besides, the slaves is not an identity, it's a condition. It, it doesn't tell you who they were, who, who were these people. So you cannot call it the slave trade. It's absurd. And, uh, you know, you should think of it, but we don't. So these are the, the questions that you can only raise, raise when you are African and you think of it. Because when you are not, even if you are of African descent, it will not strike you that slave is not an identity, that slave doesn't tell you about the people who they were. So you know, so this is what I was trying to do very humbly. <laughs> that's, that's well said. Um, Wayatu, I wanted to ask you um, why you turned to a magical realist mode to tell your story about the founding of Liberia. And, uh, and particularly, I, I was so interested in the particular powers that your, character, your characters have. There's Bessa, who uh, is immortal. There's June Day from a Virginia plantation who has this kind of incredible strength. And then there's Norman, the Jamaican maroon who has a kind of power of invisibility. So I suppose I'm interested, how did you apportion your, mm -hmm. your superpowers b between the characters? Or was that supposed to express anything in particular? And you're also very careful to say that to not connect these to spiritual traditions that existed. You, it, in the novel, it said that Norman's powers are not Obia, for example. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering uh, what, what led you to that choice. Yeah, so this is one of my favorite questions because it allows me to let people know about the cultural tradition that I'm from. So the Vi people, my mother's Vi, the Vi people in West Africa, what is now Northern Liberia and Southern Sierra Leone, um, in their storytelling tradition, it was rare that I heard stories um, with characters that didn't have some sort of supernatural occurrence or ability. Um, it was just it was, I don't think I ever heard a story growing up where the characters wouldn't be having a conversation and then one 
in order to, you know, maybe go to the restroom or go to the neighbors would fly or, or just do something that was supernatural. So that's what I, that was my introductory to storytelling. It was my introduction and it's how I came to understand how stories worked. It's how the architecture of story includes some supernatural aspect, right? And so because of that, when I started to write and um, decided that I wanted to pursue uh, literature as a career, magical realism, fantasy, Afrofuturism, all of those terms now, um, I just very organically fell into them because that's how I understood that stories worked. I think even in the most realistic context for me, um, if I'm lucky enough to write subsequent books, um, I would still find a way to include that because it's culturally true for me. Um, so, so I say that to say it wasn't something that I determined I would have to do or it wasn't a conscious choice. I just began to write a story and realized in writing that, oh yeah, this character is going to perhaps be immortal and another character. And um, in terms of, of how I determined what their powers would be, I really wanted to tell the story of Liberia in its vastness and complexity. And Liberia is complex because of the identities that make up the Liberia that we know. Because of course, to Leonora's point, um, Liberia as a country, as, the, as a region and as a people, it existed long before we, be, we, be, we knew it as Liberia or Monrovia, right? And so, um, but Liberia as a republic is comprised of these indigenous groups, um, freed blacks and former slaves from America and freed blacks and former slaves from the Caribbean. It was this just beautiful pan-Africanist experience um, that I wanted to explore because at its essence, I feel like Liberia asked the question, what happens if you bring together a black body from Virginia and a black body from um, the, from South America, from the Caribbean, a black body from all over the world, and we can ask ourselves these questions now. Like, like how would you explore that in literature, showing that these black bodies stretched across the world have so much in common? Um, and that's at the heart of what Liberia is and what it meant for me. And so these groups that do comprise the identity of Liberia, um, I wanted to show their individual powers through the powers of the, the characters. So for instance, Bessa being immortal, um, a statement to what Leonora said, having existed for a very long time before the Republic was, was founded and will still be there, even if it turns into something else, that ethnic group, the Vi people, and, and these ethnic groups that existed before the lines were drawn at the Berlin Conference will always be there. Um, June Day, his superhuman strength um, Junde is a slave on a Virginia plantation, and during his first encounter with an overseer, he realizes that when he's being whipped, his back doesn't scar. And they try to shoot him, and his skin repels bullets, and that's when he escapes the plantation and ends up in Liberia. And so, through his superhuman strength, wanted to explore the resilience of African Americans and how the, the sacrifice and the struggle of African Americans contribute to my current freedom as an African immigrant, right? Wanting to speak to that. And then Norman Arrigan, his invisibility, he is the son of a Jamaican Maroon and a British scholar. And the Maroons were able to successfully rebel from their slave masters and escape up a mountain and essentially became invisible. So, so all of the powers corresponded with the um, identities that are represented. I really love that. It, it just became clear like halfway through. These are not arbitrarily chosen. And, yeah, and you no. found a way to really express Liberia's uh, identity through those. Um, Jennifer, so I wanted to bring us back to family a little bit. You were talking about Conquo as a father being the main subject of discussion um, back in the day. Um, so one of the most interesting things uh, about Chintu to me is that as we move between eras, places, belief systems, but in every situation, there is some kind of family arrangement. It's very different, and family is just impossible. People can't uh, fulfill the roles they're supposed to have. So Chintu, the original patriarch, he has too many wives and sets of children, and, and the, the family politics just becomes too difficult for him. Then, uh, you know, in the, in the 80s, uh, Su'ubi grows up in this kind of 
rooming house that is a surrogate family for her. Then later we have uh, your other character, Miisi, who lives with all of his grandchildren. And, and so I, I started thinking to myself, um, so do you think that families are a good microcosm of, of nations? And uh, what's interesting to you about the point where families fail, where someone can't fulfill their, the role they're supposed to fill in a family? Um. In, in the beginning, um, in, in 1750, um, the patriarch is forced to marry twins because in my culture at the time, um, twin women were married to the same husband because you don't separate twins. But he was in love with the younger twin and didn't want to marry the older twin even though a lot of people couldn't tell them apart. And he said that, you know, the Baganda believe that twins are one person. And at one level, before they are born, this one person cannot agree with himself or herself and splits into two. And if at that point where primal, we can't agree with ourselves, how can we agree as a community? And that's where the struggle within the family comes from. So the family is the smallest unity. Uh, you, yeah, the smallest unit of a community or of a nation. And if you look at the family, then you see the society. So where I come from, we have 46 ethnic groups, OK? Somehow the British decided that all of us belong together. You know, they just threw us together and said, you're Uganda. And you look at a family man who has more than 46 children. They're his children, but they can't agree. You know, now you think of a nation, uh, 46 sensibilities in terms of culture, how on earth did the British imagine that you know they can throw us together and suddenly we will become nations? And then when things go wrong, they sit back in Britain and think, oh my God, we put everything together, but look at them. And actually, sometimes we do too. We, we sit there and we say, oh, why aren't we like America? Oh, why aren't we like Britain? But actually, it took Britain 2,000 years to get its act together. You know, and when it did, then it traveled elsewhere and decided that what we have is good for you regardless of your cultures. So for me, I thought that the family is where you start and then you see why everything is going wrong. But it's not all bleak. Um, there's the belief that, you know, as time goes on, we will adapt because as in my culture we say that um, loved ones are like gods. Even when they knock each other, they don't break. So somehow, somewhere, we'll, we'll work it out. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think we're going to uh, turn, turn it over to the audience for questions now. Uh, for two, we have time for two questions, I'm told. So. nothing brilliant to say about it <laughs> I, you know uh, I think it's a pity to that this panel you know exists but you know we want you to read our novels so we're here <laughs> As, <laughs> and you know I really don't have anything to say about it 
Um, I would say actually that the idea of Africa as a monolith exists less so in the literary industry. I actually think that the growth and the interest, interest in African literature is because Chimamanda was recognized as this like gold mine. So the industry said, oh, Nigeria is just one country. Like, let me find 53 more Chimamandas. And I think that's, that's essentially what's going on, is the exploration of these different countries and realizing that this is just one identity and Nigerian literature is, is one out of a, a massive continent. So. Uh, did you know Wakanda is from Waganda? <laughs> uh, yeah, I had to say that. Um, for, to be fair, for a very long time, and the, I have to respect the Nigerians. Of course. For a long time, the Nigerian, a Niger, you're a Nigerian. Well, I changed my mind now. <laughs> <laughs> we don't like them very much. My husband's Nigerian. Is he? Yes. Mm. Um, for a lo very long time, Nigerian literature was actually African literature. Mm -hmm. For a long time, Things Fall Apart was the African novel. Yes. And while I hated it, I have to respect what uh, Chepe the Wale Shoyinka yes. did for, for the rest of Africa. Yeah. But at the moment, even Uganda is becoming visible, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's entirely up to us to show the world that uh, there are 54 na nations and you're going to start to look at these nations. But actually, in the end, um, even things fall apart, will cease to be Nigerian and it will be Igbo. Mm -hmm. Okay? We're, we're just going to sh fail to force the world mm -hmm. to start seeing Africa from a very different point of view. So mm -hmm. Africa is no longer a country. Mm -hmm. Everybody agrees with that. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, now national literatures are arising. But within our nations, we are going to start looking at different cultures, you know, to force the world to, sh to see that actually what you have are nations within nations. We have time for one more question in the back. Research for me. Um, so I obviously did a lot of reading. Um, I spent as much time as I could in Liberia, um, speaking to the oldest Liberians that I knew. Like my grandmother, for instance, she's about 93, and asking her questions about her childhood. Um, for the Americo Liberian piece, the Freedmen's Bureau, um, the Congress, the Congress, American Congress has actually a good bit of data on um, Americo Liberian immigration to Liberia. So that was helpful for me as well. Um, for me, I wrote a lot from oral traditions because most of Af Ugandan history was oral history. Mm -hmm. So it was passed down by word of mouth. Exactly. And um, um, some of the Europeans that wrote about pre, pre, uh, pre before Europe arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Con I know, it's, it's so conditioned. Um, and most of them wrote from those oral traditions. So it sometimes it's just the naming of a place. Sometimes it's a saying. Sometimes it's a greeting. But sometimes it's a myth. And you realize, you know, there's some truth there or a legend. So there was that. Then there were the, um, the journals of the first Europeans who arrived in Buganda and uh, the missionaries, they wrote journals and some of them are available in, in Britain. But of course those had very Eurocentric views so you have to blow away the chaff uh, and sometimes the narratives were told from male point of view because the historian 
oral historians were men and therefore the history was very masculine. Again, you had to blow away the chaff to find a little bit of gem about women's history. So, and then of course, the uh, history from, from books. You know, so that's uh, kind of the research I did. But I must point out that a lot of history, there's what we call cold hard facts of history. And then there's history in, in, in the written. Because recently the cold hard facts have been discovered to be also fictitious up to a point of view. Um, I've found that people believe the history in literary novels or historical novels better than they do in um, history, history. So much of British history, they prefer Shakespearean history than their history. And for me, therefore, I take the whole I, uh, idea of writing history very seriously because I know at one point my version of history could become the history. That's a good note to end on. Well, thank you so much to... Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I will not fight to answer. <laughs> I saw your arms folded. I, I'm sorry. No, no, but no. I think my answer is not necessary. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Who are you? I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that you wanted to answer, and I thought we were out of time. There's really no big deal about it, you know. Thank you. Thank you for coming out, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>